Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. I just want to acknowledge the elephant in the room. <laughs> yes, I got a haircut. And, uh, <laughs> to some of you, that was a great relief. Um, and for those of you to whom this is a topic of conversation at all, seriously, get a hobby. Okay? Um, <laughs> speaking of extreme things, um, don't you like extreme stuff? Don't you like to watch extreme sports? You know, the guys with, on the motorcycles that are in the arena, and they jump 100 feet up in the air, and they flip the motorcycle and then detach from it in midair, and on, you're watching on TV, and your stomach comes up in your chest, and like, oh my goodness, it's kind of thrilling to see people living at the absolute edge of their capacity. Um, it, I, when I was a kid, I loved Evil Knievel. Anybody old enough to remember Evil Knievel? Oh, man, yeah, thank you very much. All the old folks, I loved Evil Knievel. <laughs> He's the best. Uh, when I used to, I used to love him. He, he, was, he was a stunt guy for all of you young people. He was a guy who drove a motorcycle, and he jumped over buses and semi-trucks, and, you know, and he was always setting a new record, right? And now he was very famous for, for being a stunt guy and setting records and things. He was equally famous for having broken every bone in his body as well in the course of doing that. And then you look at like shows like on the Discovery Channel, and there's these guys who are out there. They got the bright idea. They're going to grab onto the nose of a hammerhead shark and let it pull him around in the water. And you just gotta gotta wonder who is the first guy to look over at the sharks and go, "Hey, I got something I want to try." <laughs> you know, there was another show, and I, I kid you not, it was this uh, this guy, and, and he was gonna teach this gal something new. So they're going down to a river, and on the bottom of this river, alligators are sleeping. Okay, apparently they sleep under the water. So they were going to do this. They are going to go down to the river, and you can do this thing where you go down, and if you get it just right, mind you, you can get your hands under the nose of this alligator, and you can lift him up, and you can gradually kind of pull him up to where you push the whole animal all the way to the surface of the water while he's sleeping, in case you need that skill. <laughs> it's very entertaining to see people live out on their edge of their capacity. But now here's the common denominator in all of those stories. It's this. There is very little margin for error. Very little margin for error, whether you're evil Knievel or the person with the crocodiles. There's just not a whole lot of wiggle room in there. Now, what does that have to do with us? See, we're in a series called How to Be Rich. It's not about how to get rich. It's about how to be rich. And today, we're going to see what this idea of margin, how it plays into the whole thing. The Apostle Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, and what he says to Timothy here is this, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The big idea for this series is this, God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. We established that in the first week. If you live in America and you have even a moderate income, maybe even a car, you are in the top sliver of percentile of people on the planet in terms of your standard of living. The big idea for week one was this, I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. And last week, the big idea was this, because I have more, I will give more. This is where it started to get tough for us. Because, you know, here, here's the thing is, we don't really necessarily feel like we have more. We feel more like we're maxed out, and we need more. That's what we're going to talk about today, because the big idea for today is this. In order to give more, I have to create margin. In order to give more, I have to create margin. You look at this, Paul writes to Timothy, and we've made it very clear that, you know, he said, hey, command those who are rich to be rich in good deeds, to be generous. And then we say, okay, guess what? Everyone here in the room is rich. And you're sitting here going, well, I don't feel rich. I pretty much feel overextended in every conceivable area. I'm maxed out in my time. I'm maxed out in my finances. I'm maxed out in my relationships. I'm maxed out all over the place. And, and now you've got another thing for me to do. You want me to go ahead and start giving stuff that I don't feel like I even have. So in order to do that, we have to figure out how to create margin. And so you say, Troy, what is this mythical margin you speak of? Thank you for asking. <laughs> margin is this. Margin is the difference between what I have and what I need. Between what I have and what I need. Sometimes the definition of need gets a little bit sketchy. 
You know, you ever notice that? But I need a new car. I need dessert. That's what my children say a lot. I need dessert, Daddy. I need a cookie. <laughs> Do you really need it, son? You know, can you exist without it? Sometimes which the difference between what I have and what I need, that can be a little iffy. What I, you know, margin is this, is getting to the end of the month and having money left over in the bank, which is a new concept for many of us, right? Some of us, uh, margin is like, you know, okay, I've allotted X amount of time for this project. I only really need hours, but I'm giving it 10 hours because you never know what's going to come along. Margin is having kind of the emotional headroom to deal with conflict in your relationships so that you just don't come apart every time something goes wrong. Now, how do we create this? How do we deal with this in life? You know, those opening stories I told you about, Evil Knievel or the Alligator Wrangler or whatever, it's kind of fun. I mean, is it not entertaining to watch these people? Everybody likes the croc hunter and everybody likes to watch the guy jump in the motorcycle. And that's, that's entertaining. But the truth is, to watch someone you care about live an unsustainable life and see them crash is no fun. No fun at all. It's no fun to see a young couple that you care about get married and get themselves overextended financially to where they're stressed out and freaked out and they've got no emotional headroom for any kind of conflict in their marriage at all. It's no fun to watch somebody that you care about neglect and maybe abuse their bodies for a lifetime and wind up in the hospital with a heart attack. It's not entertaining to watch them have to nurse a bucket of medication for the rest of their lives. It's no fun to watch a family where, whether it's a mother or a father, you know, they're eagerly in pursuit of the American dream and they're going for it and they're taking on all the extra responsibilities and promotions and they're spending all their time with all these other people only to wind estranged from their children. There's nothing entertaining about any of that. And you and I, we feel this pressure in our culture to, to somehow succeed to somehow push ourselves to the limit. You know, some eagle song, take it to the limit, life in the fast lane. You know, we're always going for it. We think it's entertaining and it's glamorous. But once you start getting into that role, it's not as fun as we thought it was going to be. We attain one level of success only wanting another one. We get the next car, the next house, the next promotion, the next bit of influence, only to find it lacking. And it's not just that we're driven by greed for consumption. It's not just that we're driven by our pride. Sometimes we're driven by fear. Fear of falling behind. Fear of missing out. Fear of what other people think, that they may not think we're as successful as we want them to think. And maybe it's just fear that we're not going to matter. As margin decreases, stress increases. As margin decreases, stress increases. When we look at this, I got these numbers up here. We got 180. 100 is just kind of our capacity. It's our absolute limit in a given area. And 80 is kind of an arbitrary way of just helping us to see that there could actually be space in there. And as we pursue these things, um, we look at it like this. The closer you get to your capacity, the more your stress goes up. It's like you head to work and you typically have 20 minutes to drive to work and you get on the freeway and it's a normal day and all of a sudden you hit traffic and it slows you down. And the closer you get to the time you're supposed to be there and you're still sitting in the car, what happens? The blood pressure is going up the whole time. See, as your margin in time decreases, your stress increases. As you look at your budget, you know, somebody just starts talking about the family vacation and you feel that your gut rise up and you need because you know how much that's going to cost. As margin decreases, stress increases for all of us, whether it's in our time or money, whether it's in our health, we're impacted by that on multiple levels. And see, what's happened is, is a lot of us, we create this pressure. We've accepted this other standard, this way other people have told us the way we're supposed to live. Other people have told us what, what it looks like to win, what it looks like to have it together. And Romans 12 says this to us, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that be testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Maybe this idea, this external pressure of success it's not something we need to accept. Maybe we've imposed on ourselves an unsustainable standard. And we're taking what everybody else thinks, how we're supposed to live, and we're making that normal. And, you know, and you're, you're pushed and you're pushed and your calendar is full and you're just, you know, your finances are full and you go into the next thing and the next thing and somebody says, hey, are you enjoying life? And you say, no, and I don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> Does that feel like you today? Maybe the mark of success isn't, isn't 
doesn't have anything to do with your income. Maybe it has nothing to do with what you drive or what neighborhood you live in. And maybe it has nothing to do with your position. Maybe the metric for success, maybe we need a new dashboard. Maybe it looks something like this. Is it fulfillment? Is it peace? Joy? Intimacy? Maybe it's just freedom from anxiety. And is it possible that this American idea of success isn't what it's cracked up to be? So before we can start to prioritize, before we can start to figure out how to find margin in all these different areas of our lives, I think we need to redefine what a win is. We need to clarify what the new win is. What's the new normal? Success is fulfilling God's purposes for my life. The creator's purpose for your life, not your neighbor's purpose for your life. See, because you and I, we're, even in, a, in an e- economy that is down, we're not lacking options. If we're being honest, you know, maybe our lifestyles had to change and adjust a little bit short of losing your job or something, but, you know, we, we're not lacking options in entertainment. We've got plenty of entertainment, free, you know, cheap, available entertainment, free, cheap, available food. We've got all these other options for us to fill up the space, to fill up the time. We're not lacking in resources, and it's not an economic problem really most of us face. It's a priority problem is how do we measure out what is truly important? A lot of us, we think by, we, we want to thumb our noses at God and say, hey, God, you know what? I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live my way. I've got a plan. And then we see we're going to step outside of the boundaries that he's clearly given to us in Scripture and exercise our freedom. And the ironic thing about that is in the exercising of that freedom, the things that we pursue that we think are freeing us really are enslaving us. We become enslaved to maybe certain kinds of addictions. We become enslaved to other people's expectations. Maybe you become enslaved to creditors. But we wind up putting all these external limitations on us when God was just trying to set us free. Now, some of you here today are in a season of life where maybe you're a fresh year student, you just got out of school and you got your entry-level job and, and you're living in an apartment and you're still driving your Vespa around in the wintertime, you know? And you're not really living extravagantly. And this is a season that's really tight for you. Or maybe you just lost a job. And you're wondering, what's next? Maybe you're a single mom or a single dad and you're working a couple of jobs just trying to take care of your family. And you're going, Troy, you know what? I'm at the top of my capacity here. And here's, here's really what I know. Life does this for us. We get up next to our capacity, and it comes down. We get up there, and the whole point is not to live up here, not to stay here forever, but if you are here, honor God now. Honor God with what he's given you now, even if it's just a little bit, and come up with a plan towards what is sustainable, towards what is healthy, what brings you freedom, what brings you room to breathe. That's kind of the whole point of this thing here today, is to figure out how we can find that new normal. Um, Gwen and I, my wife Gwen, who's here somewhere, where are you, honey? Raise your hand. There she is. Oh, in the back, okay. She threw me. She's usually sitting in front. She's very people distracted, so she sits in back, and she looks at the back of your heads and makes up stories for all of you (laughs) during the whole service. (laughs) That's just how she rolls. Um, I tell you what, um, speaking of margin here, we kind of... I'm a little embarrassed to say we kind of had our margin financially is kind of eaten up right now. We're basically living pretty close to our maximum capacity. Now, part of that is just circumstantial, and part of it is just flat out, I'm going to own mismanagement on my part. You know, we've typically, in our whole marriage, even before we got married, you know, we were following Dave Ramsey before Dave Ramsey was Dave Ramsey. We were doing that kind of thing way back in the day. We've never carried credit card debt. Our cars are paid off. The only debt we really have is our house, and... And it's just been something we're trying to manage. And those of you who are here today and you're like seventy, eighty thousand dollars in credit card debt, you're saying, cry me a river, Troy. Okay, I'm, I get that. I'm sorry. But I mean, but this is just our story. This is where we're at right now. And we have, you know, we had a good cushion, a good kind of margin. And then the last few years, from, you know, not getting a cost of living increase, from taking a pay cut for a portion of this year, from kids having medical uh, issues that have come up that have been a lot of expenditure there, um, surprise car stuff. Anybody feel me on that? You had to shell out a couple thousand dollars because your car won't go. Um, all those little things coupled together, and they kind of, they add up to a lot. But you know what else adds up? Is the way we manage the little things. 
You know, we, we took a vacation when we probably should have taken a staycation. <laughs> you know, when we were at the anniversary dinner, instead of, instead of spending the $100 on the anniversary dinner, maybe we just could have spent 40 bucks. The important thing is just that we're together. It's all those little pieces. It's not extravagant, but you and I, what happens is, is our consumption nearly always follows our income. If we're not careful, we will always spend what we have. That's the way we roll. We're Americans. We are consumers. And I'm no different than you are. And I like the next shiny upgrade, the new thing, the this, the that. I love that stuff. But now we're in a place where now it's time to cut back. Now it's time to come up with a plan to get us back to our sustainable kind of 80% area. So you know what? We're, we're making some changes, guys. We're doing stuff like got rid of cable TV. Uh, getting rid of the DVD portion of the Netflix plan, you know. Um, got rid of the, you know, the health club membership that one of us wasn't using. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you. Um, you know, we talked about the vacation, maybe getting rid of the hard line phone in our house. Um, uh, the thermostat will both go up and down in the summer and the winter. Uh, we don't really need to buy clothes. We, we bought them before because truth is we have more than we can really wear. Um, babysitting, you know, we can back off from that. Instead of doing a date night every week, which we typically do, now we're going to do a date day because in the date day, everything is cheaper, right? Food's cheaper, movies are cheaper, all that kind of stuff. It's not, it, it's not big stuff, but over time it adds up. Do you realize if you quit buying drinks when you go out to eat or for a family of four, Right? And we don't eat out that much. In, in a couple of years, it's easily $1,000. Right? You drink, it's $1.50, 2 bucks, sometimes more than that. Just a simple thing, cutting away on stuff like that, adds up to a whole lot later and is going to get us where we need to be, back to our sustainable new normal. Now, there's one item, when I'm looking at the budget the other day, Gwen and I were sitting around and we're trying to figure out, okay, how can we tighten this stuff up so that we can get back to where we want to be? There's a line item that you and I might be familiar with called giving. And I'm looking at the giving line item. And now, we, I'm not trying to be a hero, okay? So please don't hear that. But we have always given 10%. So we have our 10%, which is our tithe. And then we have our commitment to impact and um, one life and just some other things that come along. And I look at that giving thing and I go, man, we could get the margin back really fast if we just backed off on that for a while. You know, just for a few months, really. And then I just go, holy cow, think about what you're thinking, Troy. Because it's God who got us here in the first place. We've been honoring him for years in our giving. It's been fundamental. It's been at the bottom, you know, it's been the, it's been the foundation of the whole thing. And as soon as things get tight, as soon as we get in trouble, I'm going to say, hey, God, you know, I got this. I'm good. I got it. Does that make any sense? Because it all belongs to him anyway. And I want to suggest to you, a lot of us think of it like this when we talk about time or, or tithing, whether it's on our time or money or, or opportunities, we tend to think about it kind of like up in here. Well, if I have some margin, you know, if I have some space in life, I'll give it. But if I don't, it's just kind of optional. And I want to suggest to you that it's this. It doesn't belong up there. It belongs down here. It's fundamental. It's foundational. And the truth is, man, God has been so good to us, I can't imagine dishonoring him now. I'd rather sell the house than to start backing away from this thing that's been so fundamental to him in our lives this whole time. And I'm not trying to be noble. I'm not trying to be a hero. I'm not doing, trying to do the nice pastor thing. I'm just telling you, this is how I feel. That it's a foundation. And we keep saying, God, we want you involved in our lives. I want you to bless my life, God. I want you to bless my finances. I want you to bless my relationships, God. I want you to give me more time. Give me more opportunity. Help me be a blessing to other people. And then we say, but by the way, I got this part. And then when you get in trouble, you ask for his help. Me too. Something's got to shift, guys. See, this dynamic in our nature is we are consumers. And you and I both know that we look at this and we go, hey, you know what? You know how I can fix this? I can just start making more money. I'll just get a better job, get a promotion. Does that really work? Think about it. If history is any indicator, it's our consumption always keeps pace with our income. In some cases, it outpaces our income. Now, you business people, I'm not much of a business guy, but when, when you have more going out than coming in, and you look at your, your accounting and your books, what do you call that? Going into, the, going into the red, right? That can happen in your health. That can happen in your finances. 
It can happen in all these other areas, and we push ourselves and we max ourselves out, and then when things come, life happens to us, we go in the red. As margin decreases, focus narrows. See, when we want to consume, the, 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 the challenge is this, the discipline is this, is to resist filling up every category with all the good, permissible, wonderful things in life. And we squeeze out space for the best things. It's not that it's, it's a bad thing to do this thing or go to the game or to spend the money or get the upgrade. It's the problem is what it does to our vision. See, as margin decreases, our focus narrows. You ever seen those horses? You know, you go down to the plaza and you see the Clydesdales or whatever, they're, and, and they're out there and they got the little things here. They do that because the horses get spooked by things coming out of their peripheral vision. And when you and I, we max ourselves out in our time, in our finances, in our opportunities, in our relationships, in our health, our focus narrows because all we can think about is us. I'm juggling this plate, and I'm doing this, and I'm keeping that, and I'm, I feel sick, and I feel hurt, and I got no money, and I'm stressed out. And all you can do is just think about, I, I'm sorry, I, I got no space for anyone else but this right here, right here in front of me. And see, what happens is we haven't learned how to be rich. We've learned how to be self-involved. And, and what those opportunities come for us to be a blessing. We just can't even see them because we're so consumed with our lives. As margin decreases, the focus narrows. And here's what I want to contend for you guys. The best opportunities, the best opportunities and the greatest challenges all happen in the margin. Those things, those, those God opportunities that he brings to us, you know, the person that just needs a, needs a touch from you, a blessing, a kind word from you, the person at Home Depot that you can just slap on the back and say, hey, you're doing a good job. Just the person who might come into your path who might, might just need a little bit of encouragement, might need a blessing. Maybe it's to go on a short-term mission trip or, or get involved in preschool or somewhere or whatever it is, but those things come our way and we squeeze them out. And the best opportunities, those things that God places for us, always come in the margin. You know what else comes in there? The challenges. Because guarantee you, gang, the relational crisis is coming. The physical crisis is coming. Right? Statistics are in. One out of one of us die. Okay? We don't want to usher that in any sooner than we have to. And, and, and what happens is when we don't take care of our bodies, we squeeze out any kind of margin. And then when flu season comes around, you get sick. And then you don't just get sick, you keep it forever. You know, you're, you go out to your driveway. My, I see my buddy Dave McNeil here, and he was telling me a story about a couple of years ago before he started working out where he said, Troy, you know what? I shoveled my driveway the other day, and I didn't wind up in bed for the next two days. Physical margin, margin in our health, margin in our finances when those opportunities come our way because there's going to be a financial crisis. And if you've got no margin, all you got, all the place you got to go is in the red. That's just life. That's how it works for you and I. So there's two misconceptions I want to clear up today. One, I've got this mentality I, from I can do anything to I was created with limits. Anybody who's ever watched American Idol knows all about people's limits. They don't always know about their limits. But you and I look at that limit and we go, it's something called talent, and you ain't got it. <laughs> you were created with the very specific limit here. But I believe. It's my dream. I'm going after it. I believe. If I believe it strong enough, it's going to happen. No. <laughs> it ain't never going to happen. And I'm not a dream buster. I'm not a dream killer. I'm just saying God didn't give you the capacity to do that thing. Me, for instance, my lifelong dream is this. I want to be a linebacker for the Chiefs <laughs> or some professional football team out there who's winning something. Um, I want to be a linebacker. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to immerse myself in football and I'm going to learn all about it and I'm going to dream and I'm going to believe. I believe. I believe I can be a linebacker and I'm going to be passionate about it and don't you ever try and tell me that I can't do it. Don't you dare be a dream killer. I'm going to be a linebacker for the Chiefs and maybe, maybe somehow they actually let me on the field right? And in the first hit, I'm going to crumple like a delicate little flower. <laughs> because I clearly was created with limitations that are evident to everyone. And you and I, we have limitations in our finance, in our time, in our health, in our relationships. My wife is a people person. She's got way more people energy than I do. I just like, after two handshakes, I'm done. So, you know, that's why I seem, I really am the way I seem. Um, We've all got these limitations that God has given to us, and we need to learn to accept them and deal with them and manage them. Secondly, 
From this idea of I will use the resources of my life the way I like to, all the resources of my life belong to God. And he has called me to manage them. We tend to look at everything, well, I'm going to divvy up my stuff and maybe God will get a piece of it. Well, here's the truth of it, guys. It all is his in the first place. And the sooner you figure that out, the better off you're going to be. The sooner you figure it out, the sooner those priorities are going to line up. Anybody remember um, Finding Nemo, that movie? I just love that. Um, the, the theologians at Pixar have given us a nice picture here today. Um, there's a scene in there where these seagulls are chasing the little fish through Sydney Bay, right? Okay, remember the seagulls? What's the one word they know? Mine? 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 And we laugh. They're kind of silly, dumb animals, of course. They want everything. But guys, I'm telling you. Is that not you and me? Is that not the heart cry of pride? Mine? It's all about me? Mine? You know what? My time. You're on my time. It's my body. My money. Yo. My stuff. My plans. My priorities. My agenda. My pride. My will be done. And what's the antidote to that? It's worship. God, this is your time. This is your body. It's your money. God, your plans, your priorities, your agenda, your glory. Your will be done. Because when we finally surrender that thing, we figure out who we are. When we finally surrender that thing, we find our purpose, we find hope, we find direction, we find meaning. And until then, we're going to keep chasing our tails and wonder why we never catch it. Margin doesn't happen by accident. We need a plan. You and I both know if we're just left, left to our own purposes, our spending is always going to keep pace or outpace our income. It happens that way in our time. It happens that way in our relationships, with our health. You know, it's the American way, man. If, if it's there, I'm going to do it. I'm going to use it. I'm going to eat it. I'm going I'm to play it. I'm going to serve me because I'm a terrific consumer and it's my time and my stuff and this is how I want to fill up my life. We need a plan. First of all, I want to tell you this. Give thanks just give thanks. Gratitude before God for every breath in your lungs, every opportunity, every relationship, every day to live. It is so hard to have a grateful heart and still have a sense of entitlement. Give thanks. Two, observe the Sabbath. Really? You can write that in. Really? Observe the Sabbath. Now, okay, you know what the Sabbath is? mandated margin. God went to Israel and he said, hey, Israel, look, you're going to work Sunday through Friday, but Friday night when the sun goes down, your to-do list goes away. You're finished. Thou shalt not fill up thine calendar on Saturday. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can do those things, but I want you to go from a human doing to a human being. I want you to spend time with me, spend time with your family and those relationships, those things that bring life to you. It's one of the top 10, if there's such a thing. A top 10 commandments, right? Keep the Sabbath holy, separate, sanctified, special. And you and I abuse it all the time. So I didn't get permission to do this. Um, but here goes. I may be freshening up my resume on Monday, Dave. So uh, your pastors, Sean, Dan, Dan, Jeff, Brian, John, we abuse this all the time. So you have permission to hold us accountable. When you run into Sean and say, hey, did you get a Sabbath this week? You run into Dan, run into Brian, say, hey, did you take, did you observe the Sabbath? Did you keep it holy? Was it sanctified for you today? We're always holding you accountable for stuff. Now it's your turn. Help us not abuse this very clear commandment from God. And in turn, do it for yourselves. Number three, what good things will I give up to make room for the best things? 
What good things will I give up to make room for the best things? Guys, primarily margin is created by saying no. Ugh, that's hard. All the good stuff, it's like not against the upgrade. I'm not against the shiny thing or the this. But the point is, is when we, when, when we don't keep pace here, we don't, we don't manage those things, they squeeze out room for all the best stuff, all the God stuff, all the meaningful stuff gets squeezed out by eh kind of things. Margin is created by saying no. Maybe it's, you know, we just got to say no to dessert. <laughs> you know, no, no to a second helping. Maybe it's saying no to the, you know, no to the video game. Maybe it's just saying no to, you know, the upgrade. Maybe it's saying no to someone who wants your time so you can say yes to the person who needs your time. I don't know. Is it possible that it could be saying no to the promotion? No to somebody else's expectation of what your life should look like? What good things are you going to give up to make room for the best things? You know, it's no surprise that Jesus is our example. <laughs> when you look at him, he just seems to move with such grace. You never see him in a hurry. You never see him in a rush. There's no, there's no verse that says, and Jesus gathered the apostles unto him, and they hurried off to Capernaum. You know, it just, you just don't find that. He is always on purpose. But he says, I am about my father's business. He knows exactly what he's doing. He, he has his priority straight. He knows exactly what he's trying to accomplish. And he brings people with him along the way. He takes care of his body, you know. You see there are times when he's hungry and he has to eat, times when he needs to sleep. What, he was in the bottom of the boat taking a nap during the storm. The disciples were freaking out. He was like, I need a nap, yo. <laughs> there were times when Jesus, he knew he had to get away just to be with the Father, to energize him in his spirit. So he would go away to lonely places to pray. He was doing the best thing that would make him better for everything else. Jesus is our example to walk with him, to know him, to love him. I love that scripture, that uh, the, what Jesus gives us here, and he says, um, he says, you know, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. And in a translation called The Message, Eugene Peterson paraphrases it and says it like this, and I really want you to, I want you to take this in right now. Matthew 11. These are Jesus' words. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Because all the stuff of life that we've pursued, that we spend all our energy and time and money and resource on, has wound up being empty. It's fun for about five minutes, and then we want the next thing, you know? And I'm the same way. And Jesus says, follow me. I'll give you rest. I won't put anything ill-fitting on you. You know, if I have any problem with that song at all, it says, if our God is for us, there's no question mark, you guys. He is for us. He is for you. He is for me. We can't imagine how he loves us. We can't imagine how he understands us. We can't possibly grasp the depth and the width and the breadth of his love. And we, we look at him, you know, I, I look at my kids and sometimes, like, I actually had this thought the other day, you've probably done this, is like, someday, buddy, you're going to understand how I love you when you have your own children. <laughs> then you're going to, you can't clue in until then. There's just no way to get that. And you have a heavenly father who knows you and I and loves us, oh, despite when our, we turn our back on him, despite when we thumb our nose at him. You look at your child and you go, I just want you to win, buddy. I just, I just want, you to, I want you to have richness and fullness in life, you know? So, hey, don't play with the stove. 
And he goes, quit trying to control me, man. <laughs> I'm not trying to control you. I'm trying to help you. I look Mike down here with his, new, his infant boy. I just go, man, you just love him. You just want to see him live. You want to see him win. You want to see him fulfill everything God has for him. It's the same for you and me. It's no different. He's not trying to control you. He's trying to set you free. He's trying to bring you life. And the standard that the world has been selling you is not working. It's a fail. It's an epic fail. Don't buy it. You've got a heavenly father who created the whole song and dance, and he's saying, if you will trust me with this thing, I can help you. He's saying you want to succeed. You want to find purpose. You want to know what success in life is this. It is to love Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to share Jesus. Because in loving him, we get to know him. We walk with him in the unforced rhythms of grace, and he teaches us how to live. We become more like him in our character, in our priorities, in our values. And in that, then we learn how to share his spirit, his love. It's not just about someone getting in your pocketbook. It's about who you are. You are a blessing because of Jesus inside of you. Your presence in this world is a blessing because of who he is. And he is in you. Get that. There's nothing more important, guys. And if we want to figure out what a win is, we want to clarify the win, we want to know what success is, we got to get the end game in our sights. And it is to know him and love him and to share him. And when you get that, all the other stuff starts to fall in line. And until then, you are going to struggle, and you are going to chase your tail, and you are going to miss the mark, and you are going to be unsatisfied every day the rest of your life until you figure it out. And as we walk with him, there is grace, and there is patience, and there is process, and there is love, and there is comfort. He is for you. He is for me. Let today be a start. I know this message probably feels like kind of a flyby, you know? It's like, oh, it's a lot of information all at once. And I'm praying that this next year we're going to do a whole series on margin because I really think we're so challenged by this whole thing. But today, let's redefine the win and start making little moves in the right direction. There's a couple of things I want to share with you, and your next step is not to buy a book, okay? But the book could help, and I don't get a piece of the action, in case you're wondering, okay? Um, this book here by Richard Swenson is called Margin. It's maybe the best thing I've ever seen on the topic. He deals in so many categories of life, and it's just really helpful in helping us to start to process and think through this. Um, if you're the kind of person who, you know, who has a difficult time with boundaries with people, with saying yes to people, with overextending yourself in relationships, this book by Cloud and Townsend called Boundaries could really, really be helpful for you. And like we said before, you know, what is normal in our culture ain't working. It is not bringing meaning. It is not bringing hope. It's not bringing success that any of us really wants to have. There's a book by Craig Rochelle called Weird that is really, really wonderful and it could be helpful for you. We have these at the bookstore. Once again, we're not, you know, we're not making a, some gigantic profit off of this. This is just another tool that could help move you a little further down the road, give you a little bit of traction in the direction that God has for you because he is for you. Make no mistake. Let's pray as we close out here today. Oh, Jesus, we come to you, Lord, and just uh, grateful for every breath in our lungs grateful for the beauty you've surrounded us with, the opportunity that you've given to us in this life just to be here, to be Americans, the way you've provided for us, for the children that you've given to us, for the relationships and the love, for more than anything, for Jesus, we thank you. Oh, God, thank you. And I pray, God, for clarity, for wisdom for all of us that we figure out what it really means to love you and to be transformed, to be like you, and to share you, your spirit, your heart, your love, to be available to those opportunities you place in our path because we pushed aside all the stuff that doesn't matter. 
and for your patience and grace and forgiveness along the way as we stumble and fall and trip and how you celebrate all the little victories with us too, God. We are grateful to be called your own. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. See you next week, guys. Bye.